You are about to witness the very exciting story of a city and its people. That city is Detroit. Detroit was really a microcosm of all of the failings happening during the Great Recession. If the U.S. or white America catches a cold, um, black America catches pneumonia. The foreclosure crisis, um, the decline of manufacturing, loss of jobs. In 2013, it really was right before the city um, went into the largest municipal bankruptcy the country has ever seen. Over 25% of it was vacant. So vacancy really is a contagion that devalues communities and it's been um, characteristic of the devaluation of communities of color. A vacant house um, devalues a street um, and it also disincentivizes lending in that community, investment in that community, which spreads that vacancy and can devalue a community. Tax foreclosure property um, in many ways perpetuates the devaluation of communities of color. Um, and it does so by taking their property um, through really the payment of actually small, small values, right? It's really delinquent taxes. And so if you don't pay your taxes, similar that, and then that to not paying your mortgage, um, your interest and your, and your um, fees get quite high and can get beyond you. And um, similar to a financial institution being able to take your property, a, a local government can step in and take this property from you and sell it to sometimes investors that are not based locally and might even be based internationally and have no real commitment to the regeneration or the revitalization of neighborhoods and communities. In the U.S. we have something that's quite unique known as a land bank. It's a quasi-governmental entity that holds vacant and abandoned property and uh, creates both strategy and um, assembly of these properties to reactivate them in, in uh, the most productive way for communities use. And that's where I was based. I was based in the Detroit Land Bank. So at the time, the land bank um, owned a significant amount of uh, vacant and abandoned property that had come to the possession of the city largely through tax foreclosure. So one of the things we did in Detroit was really just selling vacant lands to neighbors. And we sold houses for a thousand US dollars um, through an auction. That was a starting bid. Um, with the expectation and the requirement that within a certain time frame, the individual had to either demolish the property and activate it, activate the land, or they had to renovate it and have it occupied. Land and property had to be purchased by individuals rather than um, companies. And um, part of that was to rebuild community. Is um, Detroit, you know, the decade prior to the bankruptcy, 2000 to 2010, had seen an incredible bleeding from the city. It lost about a third of its population, um, which already had had significantly declined. Decline has really minimized to less than 1%. That's a pattern that is completely new and different. In 2014, there were only 12 new home mortgages in the city. The incredible thing is that within a very short time frame, you've seen that um, the annual numbers of mortgages over a thousand. Housing is actually um, civil rights work. Um, and the reason being is for people of color, particularly Black people, who were brought to this country as property, the ability to own property through ownership and to build wealth through ownership really disrupts the notion that we are not full citizens and that our communities don't matter and our lives don't matter. So in the U.S., white households have 10 times more wealth than Black households. And in places like where I live in Washington, D.C., it's even more stark. The way in which that is driven by housing has to do with the availability of lending for communities of color, particularly for Black communities. So you can see a, a house that has the same type of architecture 
age um, condition in a white community that has way more value than it does in black communities. And well, that has implications in terms of wealth that's not just individual, it's generational. Really the devaluation of communities of color has been driven by planning in terms of covenants that didn't allow people of color to live in a community or to purchase property in the U.S. as redlining. Um, a historic practice that um, ended about 50 years ago that uh, took a map of communities um, and essentially said that we can lend and provide access and investment in white communities but we are intentionally not going to land in communities of color. The um, implications of rented lining still are in place because particularly in lending, if, if there's not lending activity, then um, it makes it very difficult for lenders to come in and um, provide mortgages or other forms of loan to activate and stabilize neighborhoods. In terms of um, planning, the whole system has to be disrupted. You know, really what um, the conversations that are happening locally are around the implications of um, tax foreclosure and the government taking of property. How m willing are we to really lean in to these historical challenges that have uh, furthered institutional racism? and continue to allow for the devaluation and decline of communities of color. And really um, the dismantling of the American dream for a lot of African American communities. The changes that we need to see in planning are really focused on ensuring that diverse communities are at the center of their own revitalization, that they're positioned to not just prosper in place, but a part of this wider revitalization and prosperity um, of urban areas. And that includes you know, the preservation of affordable housing, um, equipping residents with the tools and the capital that's needed to invest in their properties and to invest in their communities and really serve as the drivers of growth.